Hey guys, this is Adam and today we're gonna be talking about Azure Table Storage, a highly scalable but very cheap storaging solution in Azure. It's your NoSQL database for everyday needs and also serverless applications. Stay tuned! So what is Table Storage? It is a subservice of a storage account. So if you have a storage account, you already have access to Table Storage. It's your NoSQL database in Azure. Simply said, it's key value attribute, but it doesn't have a schema, nor it does have any relationships, although it is designed for very high volumes of data. So first of all, how does it work? Since it's part of the storage account, it takes all the best stuff out of storage account, like Jira application, high scalability, low price, and things like that. You can process up to 20,000 rows per second, assuming one kilobyte row size. Therefore, the limit is much smaller but this is a global limit on entire storage account across all the tables that you're gonna have. And as I said, within storage account, you're gonna have multiple tables, a table, a collection of rows, so-called entities, and you can store within a single table up to 500 terabytes of data. And you can process up to 2000 rows per second, again, assuming one kilobyte row size, therefore a much smaller size in real scenarios. Within each table, you're gonna have something called entities. An entity contains multiple properties. It's a set of properties. You can think of it like columns and values. And a single entity can have up to one megabyte of data, and it's a hard limit. And additionally, each entity can have maximum 255 columns. And the property is a simple name value pair, which represents a cell within your table. And table storage includes three system properties always, partition key, row key, and a timestamp. This also is deducted from those 255 properties, therefore an effective is 252. So first of all, when would you want to use table storage? There's a lot of scenarios when you would want to use table storage, but usually this is either storing terabytes of structured data, because while this is schemaless, it still contains structure because you can define columns and types or when data can be denormalized, you don't need complex joins or schema. You know, since there's no schema, you cannot define that single column is required. You cannot create joins across multiple tables. This is a simple NoSQL database. But also you can use it whenever you need quick queries with clustered index, because this partition keys that I was talking about allow you to do queries over that. And there are additional features like OData support or JSON serialization support if you need that whenever programming against table storage. With that said, the typical scenarios that you will use table storage are usually serverless applications, and it's actually perfect for serverless application because they scale up and down very rapidly, and table storage can handle that. You can actually process a lot of data and use it for either storing data or metadata of your application, similarly to web applications. You can use it for logging if you want to, although there are some better services in Azure for logging, you can use it for very simple process logging or business logic logging. And additionally, metadata and configuration store, because they are cheap, they're highly extensible, they're very flexible, so they are perfect for storing metadata and configurations. If you decide for table storage, you are at least sure that you have SDK for pretty much any language on the market, being .NET, Java, or even Python, Ruby, PHP, PowerShell, whatever you're working in. And PowerShell should be very interesting part for those who are working with an Azure as administrator and writing scripts for automation, because you can store a lot of metadata within those storage tables. And the last thing that I want to talk about is what's the difference between table storage and Cosmos DB with table API, because Microsoft calls Cosmos DB with table API a premium experience of storage. And let me explain why. First of all, when comparing the most important things whenever using one or another, first of all comes the latency, throughput and global distribution. Those are the three most important when comparing the two. When it comes to latency, table storage is pretty fast, although there's no SLA on whenever you're gonna get it within half a second, millisecond, or just even couple of seconds. For Cosmos DB, you are getting this under 15 milliseconds for reads and writes globally. And table storage is only within one region, so you're still bounded by the distance of your data center and your client. Additional, it's throughput. As I already said, it's 20,000 operations for entire account, 2,000 operations for single table. Whereas for Cosmos DB, you can do 
10 million and more operations per table and there's no upper limit on entire account. And lastly, global distribution. As I already said, table storage is within one region and you cannot have multiple regions. You can do one readable optional replica within second region, but that's that. And Cosmos DB is globally distributed across 30 and more regions. So a major difference here. When it comes to pricing, storage and table storage is in general very cheap and Cosmos DB is very often considered expensive, especially if you're talking about those 10 million operations per second, you're gonna pay a lot for that. So remember about it. Couple of demos for today. We're gonna be creating table storage, then we're gonna be managing and querying the data within table storage. And I'm gonna show you three examples of integration with table storage from Logic Apps, PowerShell and .NET. So let's jump right to it. To get table storage, you need to create new storage account. Go to create new resource, type storage. You're gonna get presented with storage account. Hit create and start creating new stuff. First of all, resource group. I'm gonna call it table storage intro. Then I need a name for the storage account. So that's gonna be AM demo storage one. I'm gonna choose North Europe for my region. This is the closest to me. And I'm gonna change replication to locally redundant storage because it provisions faster. Hit review and create. Once the validation is passed, hit create. And the storage account will be provisioned. Once the provisioning finishes, go to the resource and start working with your storage account. When working with table storage, you get pretty much the same stuff like you would do with any blob file or queue storage. So the same access key, the same general application setup, configuration, etc, etc. In order to work with table storage, you can either go to tables here, but notice here, you're not gonna get a lot of options. You can actually create new table, call it for instance, demo, and go to that table. Notice while creating, it will already create an URL to your table within your table storage. And therefore this also defines the naming convention for your tables because they are public URLs, therefore you cannot use special signs. When you open this, notice that you actually cannot open it here. And the reason for that is you cannot manage data of a table within this panel. You can actually do it from Storage Explorer, either desktop application or this preview blade here. When you open it and open tables, you will be able to see your demo table that we just created. And within it, there's currently nothing but it allows you to do a little bit more, like adding new rows. When adding new rows, notice that by default, as I already said, you have partition key, row key, and a timestamp which is not visible because it's added by default. For partition key and row key, you can decide yourself. For instance, your partition key might be your surname, and your row key might be a name if you want to. And additionally, since this is a schema-less design and no SQL, you can add your own properties, your own columns, so you can add a new column, for instance, age, change the type to int and type 32. You can insert the data and now you have a table with row key, partition key, timestamp added by default and an age. And you can add more multiple rows if you want. John and age 55. Interestingly, you are also not bounded between the rows, so you can add or delete properties across the rows. So I can add additional row for John and call it address or country. Hit insert and notice something now. First of all, we got new column. This column has a value of US, but the old one has empty value in this one. This is very important to understand because when you start doing that, and you start removing properties for new rows, it will still allow you to insert. Therefore, you cannot define any schema here and you cannot ensure there's always gonna be the same amount of columns for each row of the table. You can also create the combined keys like clustered keys. So you can use partition key by, for instance, combining for last name with first name and then making key like that, maybe additionally adding country so that later on when you need to query, you can actually query by entire compound key rather than specific values. Because what is important is that partition key and row key are indexed, but for all the other rows when you're gonna be querying, this is a full scan. 
to make sure that your partition key and row key are very well designed. Whenever querying data, you have a query panel here, and you can actually build queries across multiple partitions. You can either add more or remove more. For instance, in partition key, you can type operator equals marjack, which in this case will return only row with that partition key. And you can add more clause if you want to. And just query again. This allows you to query your data very effectively. Just make sure that partition key and row key are very well designed for whatever data you're going to be querying. Because other than that, you're going to be making full scan across all the other properties. So make sure to narrow down to only partitions that you need and then query by the other columns. Because you can still do that. You can actually query by age if you want. And maybe you're going to find something, maybe you're not. But all the other properties are always full scans. So let's do a very quick demo. Let's create new table, call it demo2. And let's create new logic app, which we're going to use to create and update entities within demo2 table. So let's call logic app, hit create, call it demo2, use existing resource group, in our case that's going to be table storage intro, also North Europe, and hit create. Once it's created, go to the resource. I'm going to start with blank logic app. Let's say I want to run this logic app on schedule. So I'm going to type schedule, recurrence, and let's say run it every one day. So set day, set it to one, then add new step. And this time tape, type table. And you're going to find Azure table storage connector which allows you to do a lot of stuff like create table, delete table, delete entities. What I want to do is use insert or merge entity, which is create new entity if it doesn't exist or update if it does already exist. I need to type the name for the connection and select my storage account. Hit create and specify the table that you want to put the data to, which is demo2, specify the partition key. So let's say I'm going to call it user then we need a row ID, I'm going to type one, and we need the entity itself. So this is pretty much a JSON. So you need to type, for instance, name Adam, and then maybe a surname, right? A simple, very simple JSON. Hit save, hit run, and this should be pretty much enough in order to update or insert this row to the table. Whenever this works fine, you can very quickly verify by either the output here, but you can also do it by going back to your logic app, going back to the resource group, to the storage account, inside of the storage explorer, open the table and see your row in the data. And as you see, we have new properties, name and surname. So simple JSON files are enough for you to update rows within the table. And you can pretty much go back to the demo too, edit it, insert or match entity, and if I'm going to change my surname to Doe and run it again, this will update it because this is an insert or match and it will find the already existing row by partition and row key because this combination has to be unique. So let's go back to the storage account, go to the storage explorer, table, demo2, and we see Adam Doe. All right, that's it for the logic apps. Let's go to the PowerShell. For PowerShell, you will need to install a module, which is called AZ table. We will need two properties, one called group, which will be our resource group. So our resource group is called table storage intro. So let's just paste it in. And the second one, we need a storage name, which is, let me paste it in and give the storage name from the Azure portal, or we can get it from here. Just paste it in. Now we can use our scripts to work on this resource group and the storage account. First of all, what you need to do is get the context. And to do that, you need to run get az storage account. And then from that storage account, return the context value into the context. Because context of the storage account is required for all the other commandlets. So let's paste the new variable called table name. So we're going to create a table called users. And in order to create new table, you simply run a command new az storage table, pass the table name and the context. Hit enter. 
Right now we created a new table called users within this URI. We can hit refresh here on the table to find a new table already available for us. Next, what we want to do is create an object called to get that table into the context, which is get az storage account table, pass the name, pass the context and return cloud table object. Once you do that, you can specify two partitions. For this demo, we're going to create partition one and partition two so that we can also show you how to query the data. And now simply add some rows. And to add some rows, I prepared a very small script that will create four users in this storage. And let me show you what did it create. It's actually very simple commands like add az table row, pass in the table, pass in the partition key name, and then pass the properties. So as you see row key, that will be our state, username with our username and the ID. And we're just passing this along. If we did everything correctly, we can refresh, refresh on the top and review our data. So you see two rows within partition one, two rows within partition two, different states, different users with different user IDs. Once you do that, you can actually very easily query that data by using another partial command, get az table row, and then returning the data. As you see, this exactly matches what we see on the top. We can also query by partition key. So just simply add to this query a partition key, which will return only rows for this partition key. If you need more, you can find a specific table row by searching with operators like username equals Chris, in which case it returns users for this particular user. And lastly, you can simply query more. So you can use custom filters like find user by user ID. Remember, this is a full scan, but you can still do that. As you see, table storage and partial are amazing combination for you to manage your metadata in your scripts. So let's go to the last demo. Let's create table, which will be called demo free. And let's go to the very last demo with .NET. For this, I have a Visual Studio code and I'm going to initialize new project by typing .NET new console, because this will be a console application. And what I need first to do is always install new package. To install the new package, simply run .NET add package Microsoft Azure Cosmos table. And why is that? Because Microsoft recently merged the SDKs and they work for both Cosmos and table storage. So just install the new package and you're ready to go. Let's change this hello world message to table storage sample and start working with our code. First of all, we need two variables. We need a table storage connection string. A reason for that is we need to authenticate somehow and authorize in order to be able to work with this account. To get that, you go to access keys and just copy your connection string. Of course, for production releases, put it into key vault or somewhere else. It's so that it is not exposed in the code. We need to provide a table name, which is our case demo free. And we can now start working with that. First thing that you need to do after creating those variables is to create a storage account object for connectivity. To do that, we are using cloud storage account class. At first, you're not going to have those libraries included. So just press control and a dot at the end. You're going to get using Microsoft's Cosmos table using. Just add it, press enter. Now you have a storage account variable which parsed your connection string so it will know where to connect. Once you do that, you need to create cloud reference to your table. So just get the table by table name. Now that the table reference is defined, we can start adding data. I'm going to close this panel to get a bit more real state. And I'm going to create a class, a class that derives from table entity. So we can actually start inserting some rows. I'm going to pay, copy paste my class that I already created. This entity represents customer. It always has to derive from table entity. So it gets the partition key and row key by default, which I override with last name and first name in my constructor. In which case, my last name is partition key a first name is my row key. I additionally have two different properties, email and a phone number. Defining objects like that is amazing way for you to work with .NET and table storage by using actual classes and object oriented programming. So what we need to do right now is we need to add a method which will allow us to insert some rows. 
I created new method called merge user. Here I need to add system threading tasks because we're using asynchronous programming. And I created method called merge user. It takes a parameter of table. So we have our table defined and a customer entity of the class that I already defined. First of all, in order to insert or merge rows, you need to create a table operation, in which case the table operation is insert or merge, and I'm passing the customer object. And notice that after this, I simply run execute async on this operation and get the results. There's nothing else that I need to do. It's as simple as that. So let's test this out. So we need to simply create a new customer entity and add it in our code. So I'm going to add it here create a customer entity for Walter, Walter Harp, which will have his own email address and a phone number. And we're going to use that method to insert that entity. So let's save the file and simply write .NET build and .NET run. As you see, the demo runs successfully. We got table storage sample, user added. We can, of course, go back to our storage account, go to the storage explorer, go to tables, open our demo free, and as you see, Walter Harp is there. You can also very simply just change his phone number, so next time he's gonna get updated, or maybe change his Walter Harp email, and it will also get updated. Since we are already inserting and merging data, let's query the data. I will add a new method called query user, which takes, again, cloud table parameter, including first name, last name that we'll use for query. Again, to query, we need to define table operation, retrieve of customer entity. So we're doing automatic mapping from JSON table data into our object. And we need to pass first name and last name to query. And if everything works correctly, if we're gonna query for Walter, we're gonna get it and display it on the screen. Since we did that, we can actually go back to our main and query for that user. Let's add additional row inside of a main query user, and let's save it and run the sample. First of all, build. And once we've built, let's hit .NET run. And as you see, we fetched Walter Harp with updated email and updated phone number. I often say that some services are simple yet powerful. This is another great example of it because table storage is simple because you can implement it in your applications within just a couple of minutes, but powerful because it can store up to terabytes of data. If you need something even more powerful, take a look at Cosmos DB. But for you, it's up to you to decide. That's it for today. If you liked the video, hit thumbs up, leave a comment and subscribe, and see you next time.